Uh, this is, was inspired um, at the chapel of St. Bernadette of Lourdes in 1858. This uh, a chapel was built because of the vision of, of uh, Mary at Lourdes. Um, so, and, uh, and also because so much of the focus of this workshop will be on um, healing, on uh, miracles, on the intervention of, from one dimension of the sacred into our lives. What is that about? What is that? So with that in mind, this is that prayer. I want you to imagine um, heaven looking upon you and there's nothing else around you. There is no technical world. There is nothing, just silence, just you and silence and a prayer. Lay your hands gently upon me. Let their touch render your peace. Let them bring your forgiveness and healing. Lay your hands, gently lay your hands. You were sent to free the brokenhearted. You were sent to give sight to the blind. You desire to heal all illness, mine included. Lay your hands, gently lay your hands. Lord, we come to you through one another. We come to you in all our need. We come to you seeking wholeness. Lay your hands upon me, gently lay your hands. Amen. Okay. Now I wanted to introduce a couple of people, believe it or not, that sounds very funny, but I do. I want a couple of people, you to know that there are two people in this audience. Our, we rebuilt our website and I think it's particularly beautiful. And um, you ought to know, the person is here who did that. He's a genius, he's talented, and he's part of our CMED family. Jim Eaton, where are you? Would you stand up? You should get credit for your genius. Thank you. And, and, I, and, and especially since people thank me for it. And <laughs> If they only knew. I even had to borrow the plug to plug in my phone this morning. So that goes to show you how, you know, but I don't mind being thanked for it as if I did, you know, but no, we have that. And uh, Stacy Couch is here. And Stacy, uh, where are you seated, Stacy? Stacy. Stacy is um, a long time um, participant in Sacred Contracts. She's been trained beautifully to know the certification program and, and reading archetypes, and she's really superb. So if any of you have any interest in that area of CMED, which is now almost 20 years old. <laughs> oh my God. Um, <laughs> Stacy's there, she can help you as well. Okay, now it's my turn. Um, I would like to begin this morning. I was up very early shuffling notes, reshuffling and reshuffling. And I thought that the best way, the name of my new book is called A Return to Ordinary. And, um, The reason I named it that is because um, one of the crises of our time is that people, we have become a society, if not a global society, that holds the idea of being ordinary in contempt. And one of the great health crises of our time is that we actually have come to believe that the purpose in life is to be extraordinary. That that is actually a life purpose. That somehow or other being noticed 
being unique is a calling, is a purpose. People will say to me, I know I was born for something special. And where did that come from? What kind of nonsense is that? And yet, believing that will drive you insane. And it, what it will do is it will cause the beginning of the genuine path of suffering. Optional suffering. Genuine optional suffering. And it will begin the path of you cursing your life, looking for where am I special? Are they noticing me? I'm not being noticed yet. I know God has something in mind. And it will start a narrative in your head of interpreting everything through the lens of, is this, is this a sign that I'm special? Where's my specialness? Where's my highest potential? I'm not sure this is my highest potential. It will become the seeds through which you destroy every one of your relationships. I'm not being recognized for being special in this relationship. My specialness is not being acknowledged. And so I'll get to that in a moment more deeply. And that's the curse of the inner self which is in fact a curse instead of the blessing that it should have been, but could be, will be, after I kick it in the boot. But I would like, <clears throat> the return to ordinary is about getting back to our fundamental design with all of these choices that have caused us to morph away from the path we should have been on, that we started somehow or other, but the, the search and the choice to be extraordinary, to be extra than ordinary, morphed us. And it took us exactly in the wrong direction. Instead of the search for truth, it became about our personal truth. I need to tell you, I need to speak my truth instead of to tell the truth. A very significant difference. A very significant difference. So I'm, I, I, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I would like to just give the thread of how I arrived at this because it has to do with the way in which we think the way in which we see things and how that way has to kind of get, how it got deconstructed in my own perception of things and how I kind of arrived at the sacredness of the ordinary and the toxicity of the extraordinary. When I started as a medical intuitive, um, which, which was years, years, years ago, <laughs> You know, do you know what, how strange it is for me to see someone say, I've followed your work for 25 years. <laughs> what? What? I haven't been around that way, you little, get out of here. But anyway. Um, so when I started as a medical intuitive, the significance of doing something you never heard of so you didn't have that myth, I'm following something extraordinary. In, in my case, what I learned from that part of my life is that I really did want to do something extraordinary. I wanted to be a great fiction author. And I, I sometimes joke about that, but I wasn't joking. And the thing is, I have no talent. The blessing in that is that all my fantasies went into something I have no talent for, and I had no ambition to be something I have a genius for. Now, the blessing in that is that I had no, there was no sense of, am I the best? Am I the competition? Da, 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 da. There was nothing, 
Number two is there was nobody else doing it. I recently had dinner with somebody, in some young whippersnapper, who's on his way into this field. And there I am sitting across from him, looking at his phone, and I was like, if you're having dinner with me, or are you having dinner with your phone? I'm going to give you one second to make that choice. Okay, so the phone went away. And that was smart. <laughs> okay. But as we got head into this discussion here, I, I, I said to, you know, um, he said, how did you become good at what you do? And I, I want to just hit a pause button here and say, I don't normally talk about myself. This isn't about you learning about me. It's a, I, I need to be very clear about that. I'm trying, I, my intent here is to share what struck me in my own journey as my moments of awe through my own life. And, and tragically, I have to tell my own life to get there. But these were my aha moments that have led me to where I believe is my most significant time. So can we, I, I need to be, how do I say, clear about that. I don't want to say, and then this, are we on the same page here? So I tell you this with my shoes off on sacred ground. So as I was talking to him, he said, how did you become good at what you do? And I said, well, I didn't have any interest in it. And then I was blessed to meet someone who did have interest in it, who was a neurosurgeon from Harvard. And because he had an interest in it, I then started to pay attention. But all the while, I was a publisher, so I had a task. And I didn't have to earn a living doing this. So now that was very significant. So I never had to become competitive. I never had to work, like make money doing this. And then I lived in New Hampshire in a village of 800 people in a small little cabin that I couldn't even afford to heat, I will tell you. And then I moved to a farmhouse that I co-rented from a family I grew to love. And I, I lived on twelve to $15,000 a year for the next nine years. And I thought I was rich. I tell you, I thought I was rich. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I made friends in this beautiful little village. And all the while, I would, Norm and I began to do six to eight readings a day. My life was quiet. I, had not, I did not have a television. I didn't have any technology. And thank you, God, the computer and Google and the internet had yet to be created. And I told him this. I said, I did not plug myself in in this obsession to myself. You plug yourself into yourself the moment you get up in the morning and you can't unplug. You are addicted to yourself and I never was. I never was. And you are. You can't. And you're addicted into, to what is everybody else doing and are they thinking of me? You're addicted to that. I said, I'm not an addict to that. And it never occurred to me. I became intrigued by what was going on in other people. Other people became my focus, not me. So from the get-go, my focus was you. You. And what was the cause, I mean, what was, what's going on here in you? Not how can you make me famous? It never occurred to me to become famous. And I said to him, that's all that's occurring to you. That's all. Your goal is to become famous. My goal was to become accurate. The very thought that I would hurt somebody or harm somebody scared the crap out of me. 
And I was so grateful that I had a physician who helped me hone this skill. And number two, that I had faith. That I had a sense of awe. I was, grew up in a mystical community of nuns and family. I never had to work to believe. And my personal spiritual life was so mystical from the get-go that I used to, when people would say, did you think there was something weird? So how many times somebody would say to me, I thought something, did you ever, something was weird with me or strange, you know, I thought, wow, because I thought I was intuitive and I thought you'll never be any good at this. You will never, ever be any good, ever. Go peel potatoes. <laughs> In the language of Teresa of Avila, you will never be good, ever. You'll never be accurate. You'll never go do something of service that has nothing to do with training your intuitive system, your, the world behind your eye, because you have no idea what comes naturally to you. And you pay attention to what I just said right now. That's your first jewel. You have no idea what comes naturally. Clarity of soul comes naturally. It is not unnatural. You should not be surprised when you see clearly. How can that surprise you? That it surprises you is something you should shake yourself like a rag doll. It never surprised me. How could that? I used to wonder when I was young, how do you get through life not seeing clearly? How can you possibly make it through a day not hearing your angel? And then when I got older and I saw these people making things up, talking on stage, thinking that they could just call an angel to be a performer, I thought, you blasphemous fools. And you have all these people paying money, throwing money at them. I thought, you charlatans, you blasphemous fools. This is how desperate people are to come near the sacred, but not really. Not really. They're just going to a circus, paying money, so that they actually don't come near the sacred at all. It looks like sacred, smells like sacred, but it's not. Because if you really went near it, you'd take your shoes off on sacred ground, bow your heads, and actually know you're near something holy. Nobody, nobody who knows anything about the sacred would go near a sideshow. A sideshow? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's nothing but blasphemy. So as I, am I just, oh, damn right I am. Now, when I was with Norm, and this is jewel number two, my focus was understanding the connection between what was, what was wrong with somebody, but identifying illness. Identifying, you know, an illness here, a stress there, an illness, stress, illness, stress. Because I did not know this world. I never heard of chakras. I didn't know about seven energy centers. I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I was a clean slate. Absolutely a clean slate. I knew nothing about this. Which made me perfect. Made me perfect. And I didn't realize how much I knew until I wrote the book with Norm, Creation of Health. I had no idea how much I knew or that, or that I had, um, or that how organized this chapter of my life had been. A couple of points, one, Maybe this would help me <laughs> more than you, but maybe I need this to help teach. 
At this stage, and this is important because I think, in a sense, everybody de de follows this route, because I'm so special. No, <laughs> everybody follows a route. Tell me if you can see this. I want everyone to, okay. You know, I draw the chakras like this, but it's, it helps as a map of eight, nine, ten. Okay, it helps as a map of how energy and matter follow a map. We follow a map. We cannot not follow the map. It's the law. It's a mystical law. We follow the map of creation. Grace moves into energy, moves into matter. Matter shifts to energy, returns to grace. This is the map. This is the map. This is the map of how you communicate. You meet somebody in the first chakra. This is the first chakra where we are right now. The physical, where we see each other. This is our tribe. This is us in the room. Even when you meet somebody, you're going to follow this map. And if they fall out of sequence, you will not trust them because there's timing to this, a built-in timing. You meet someone in the first chakra, that's this room. There's a first chakra conversation that's archetypal. Where are you from? What tribe do you cometh from? The Chicago tribe. And you? The Sedona tribe. So then both of us go ding, 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 ding. I've heard of that. Okay, so far, so good. We have to get tribal coordinates that make us decide. We will then pursue a second chakra court conversation. Children, partner, occupation, stable, this is where you have to check these out. And if you pass there, you'll pursue a third. So do you want to sit down and have lunch? Personal. Personal. And if these pass, then you'll go into this column and you'll begin to confide and share the heart. Then you'll start sharing your energy. And you start the bonding. Now if someone goes faster, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Chicago tribe. Oh, I'm from Sedona. Can I tell you all about my heart? What? I am so out of here. This is online dating. <laughs> this is online dating, people. Let me just fill out the paperwork. <laughs> and go to online date. Take the time out of intimacy. I'll get to that. Now. During my years with Norm, I'm still with Norm. Norm and I will always be together. But during my early years in the early 80s, when I was first doing medical, my first stage of medical intuition, I was learning this part of it right here, which was the basics of one of I, the, the human energy system. This world had not opened up to me. That's very important. This world was just opening up to me, first, second, and third. Really, not this world much that had yet to open up. I was getting these coordinates, which, which basically were what these seven, that we had seven energy centers, and that, the, here's the operative word, stress participated in us becoming ill and that there were patterns to stress and that specific patterns of stress did indeed influence 
areas of the body that became sick. Yes, indeed, that is true. Now, I at this time did not involve spiritual thinking. The body, mind, spirit template had been introduced into our thinking, as had a second perception that never existed before in the collective unconscious. And this is important to understand. These two never existed before. They're indications of the evolution of us. The other was we create our own reality. So now we have two significant perceptions that are major league that had never, ever, ever existed in the human thought form system. And these were shifting the way we thought about ourselves and our own sense of empowerment. So this is a big deal to understand. Because pre-World War II, nobody, no individual would stand up and say, I create my own reality. No individual would say, I, my biological, physiological, psychological, emotional system is an integrated operating system that includes the participation of my spirit. So when I am sick, you better ask them all. So you have to understand that we took an evolutionary leap of power, and power is a huge word to cast on the table here. When we crossed into the nuclear age, we shifted the game of power and creation. The rules of creation, how we would deal with them, how they would operate, we did not change the rules, we upgraded the consequences and the dynamics of the rules as they applied to us. To us. To us. Our consciousness about how the game works here was being stripped of a naivete that existed prior to the nuclear age and upgraded to a much more sophisticated quantum level of how creation works and therefore how our choices work. What it means to make micro and macro choices. Are you following me here? So that this first level that I was learning, in this world, we operate on the idea that for every one problem, there is one cause and one solution. This is a consciousness model. This is how we work. So in this world, when I was first doing readings, the idea that we create CR, reality, had been born and it hit people like this wonderful, wow, I am so empowered. And I remember going to workshops where people would say, I know I created this cancer and I know I can create it out. And people would go, yay. And I remember thinking, what? <clears throat> but hey, I was, a, I was a apprentice at this point. So I was all about learning, all about learning. But my gut, my intuitive, my, my intuitive system was just like, like this radar going zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
I've had a, I'm inherently impersonal. It's a strange thing to say and I can't explain what I mean, except to say I've never, I've always been detached. I'm, I'm incredibly unsentimental, very detached, very, I'm just detached by my wiring. So, so it's not uncaring, I'm not uncaring, I'm deeply caring because I'm detached. I, I'm kind of like a natural born Buddhist with a Catholic soul. <laughs> and, 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 a, and a Jewish proclivity in my head because of the wisdom of the scripture. So I'm kind of wired like that. Because I, but when you are more detached, you can care more deeply because you don't have a personal investment. <clears throat> you don't have a personal investment. And the Catholic in me is completely in the mystical tradition. I have no use for Rome. That's just a halfway house for the psychically afflicted. But, but, but the... I was just born wired in a, in a way that makes me absolutely fascinated with the way the system works. And no attachment to wanting it to work a certain way for my system. And that is a third jewel. Get out of wanting it to work a certain way for you. For you. Whether it's justice, whether it's your religion, as soon as you put a my or your in front of it, you've lost the game. You've lost it. You've lost it. Because there's nothing operating here in truth that has anything to do with you. Nothing. The moment you think it's all about you, you've lost it, including grounds for miracles. Nothing here is about you. Get it straight. Nothing, and nothing ever will be. Humble up. Humble up is the name of your spiritual creed. What's your creed? Humble up. You're returning to ordinary. Humble up. That's it. The first shall be last. No kidding. Okay, now, in this world, we look for one, there must be one for one for one. Well, there isn't. There isn't. There are numerous reasons why things happen as they do. And some of the reasons, as I have discovered when we get over here, come from lives yet to be lived. Ooh, let's go, no. You stay where I'm, you stay with me right here. Because in this world, in your blood and in your bones, you wanna know one reason for one. And that is so strongly ingrained because that's the way reason works. This is why I no longer do readings. Because there's nothing I can tell anybody that is actually accurate anymore if they come from this world. So I took myself off the playing field. Because everything here, just give me one reason, just give me the reason. There's no such thing. In this world, as you'll see, you are the higher consciousness you go the more you have to detach from the world in which you reason through time and space. And you have to begin to reason through all things are simultaneous and a hologram. And that takes a phenomenal leap of consciousness when you adapt what I would call quantum or mystical consciousness as your ordinary state of mind. So now ordinary, in the natural way of divine paradox, becomes the most extraordinary state of consciousness because it is 
full-on cosmic mystical. Pause button. Question? Am I going too fast? Okay. Now, after six years, Norm and I, you know, I sort of charted away, charted away, and then I wrote Creation of Health, in which, you know, I said, well, okay, so it seems like these stresses had to do with lower back pain, which are, by the way, still accurate. Now, there's a difference between the word accurate and truth. So mind, we're gonna, I'm going to do a lecture on the power of words. Every word you use is an act of profound creation back here. The stresses that I describe are absolutely accurate, but they're not truth meaning. It's not the whole story, it never will be. So your lower back does filter into stresses related to financial matters, to survival, it most certainly does, sciatica, Absolutely. Pancreatic. The pancreas is absolutely involved in issues related to responsibility in the extreme. Absolutely. But, they, but you have to go deeper than that because you are more complex than that. You can't reduce anything to just that. And that's when I, I, I was, when I was doing these readings, I was in the mindset that itself was flawed. I had assumed that everybody wanted to heal, that everybody wanted to be fully healthy, that every, I myself was in a flawed, naive mindset. And I also was not dealing from the mindset that had anything to do with the higher operating principles of the universe. So I need to, pers put, to put all of that in perspective because if I do readings now, I, I, I position you in a hologram. My perspective is so intensely cosmic that the data I get is, it, it, pff, all right, how this shifted and for me, something shifts in an instant, and I'm sure these things, ha these happen to everybody where the light goes on just like that. Now, all of you have those light goes on moments, don't you? And look at the metaphor that we use, the light goes on. So later I need to, to do a lecture on what is light, what is darkness as two active principles of the laws. You, you must understand the nature of darkness as an active conscious principle. You can't say, oh, there's no such thing as evil. Yes, there is, and stop thinking there's not because you don't like it. Stop it. Stop being children of Walt Disneyville. It's obnoxious the way people are about that. You're damn right there's evil. Now. One day, and, and I, I wrote about this, this inner world really opened up for me in terms of the beginning of how that this is our laboratory. This is our world of lead, where things solidified. This is our world of really our five senses. And, and you, this, this is a world that has a strong hold on us, even when you tell yourself that something in this world is an illusion, it's not real, but it is when you're in that world. It is, and this is where you have to be really kind and compassionate to yourself and to others, because when you're in this world, when you're at a burlesque show, that's real. And it's real to your appetites, and it's real to your body, and it's real to your addiction, and it's real to your cravings. Your cravings. 
what your physicalness craves and what that will do to you. And I tell you the truth. If a craving has you and an angel shows up, you'll take your craving. You will choose your craving. Or you will turn to the angel and you'll say, just give me one more minute. So when you think about prayer and you think about what, what, why, why, why is this miracle not happening, you don't check your faith in God. Go check your cravings. Go understand the choices that come from having a craving that you are enslaved to. That you have to liberate the slave in you because it's stronger. This is the God you serve. And this is this world. And one day, as much as I observed this, one day I got into that world with the, the capacity to really, really kind of get it. And that was the day I was at Finhorn. This is Finhorn's my incubation place. I birthed sacred contracts at Finhorn. I got into this world at Finhorn. Finhorn somehow or other has the, the, the way that inspires me like no other place in the world. And I was in the dining room at Clooney, which is one of their buildings, and, and this, uh, I was with these two guys, and we were just chatting away, chatting away. And I was waiting to meet a friend. And as we were talking, I see my friend coming up just as a guy named Eric was coming, who used to manage this big building, Clooney, where all of the... Um, uh, visitors would stay in some of the members of the Finhorn community. So as she comes up, he says to her, I'm going to call her Mary, Mary, are you free on June 8th? Because Helen Caldicott is coming to campus and she would like, we need someone to show her around. This is a yes or a no answer. Yes or no, are you free? But instead, what Mary said was, June 8th? Did you say June 8th? I don't know. Any other day, but not June 8th. That's my incest survivor's workshop. And I would never, 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 no, no, support group. That's my incest survivor support group. And we would never, I would never not be there. And she went into this drama. And I, and so, and here are two guys sitting here that she'd never met. I had introduced her. And now she's leveling them with this chapter of her history in which she's making it perfectly clear, I am a victim of incest. I'm angry at men. So you two better talk to me in a certain way. I take the lead at this table. Are we clear here? Are we clear? They were like this. All right. They probably have never been abusive to a woman in their life, but man, they are taking the hit. So he looks at her and he says, okay, so you're not free June 8th, got it. And he walks away. <laughs> Which is not the response she was looking for, I, I later realized, all right? So I, so she and I then went to lunch. And I'm looking at her as if she had just sprouted a, a coffee pot off the top of her head. <laughs> and I'm looking and I said, I've got to ask you something. Why did you do that? Why did you reveal something so intimate publicly when you were asked if you were just free and available? Why did you do that? She looked at me as if I had the coffee pot. <laughs> and she said, because I am an incest victim. And I said, well, I know that. But why did you have to let them know that? Why did you expose your wound? Why did you do that? It's like a wound flasher. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And 
um, she thought I was being absolutely cold and judgmental. I thought she was so defensive. And there was a break there, a serious break in communication. And I thought, all you want me to do is feed your dragon here. And I am so not going to do this. But it was there that my whole teaching on woundology was born. She, I credit her. That was the moment. But in that moment, a light bulb went on. The light went on as I saw the darkness. Here's another jewel. Light and darkness walk hand in hand. If you're afraid of the darkness, you won't see your light. You need both. You need both. So with that, I started to investigate the other side of, I guess we all don't, we really don't want to heal. I guess there's, there's all kinds of little shenanigans going on in us. I guess there's a whole different, and as soon as I, you know, started to pursue and open myself questions and open myself up, to deeper questions, more rich and engaging questions, richer questions about us. I received that kind of texturous material in, in readings, in intuitive readings. So it's a match. What, and, and, and the data that makes us tick that makes us what we are, began to open up as well. We are far more complex than one answer, one cause, one solution. That does not work. Now you can live at that level, but the quality of your healing, the quality of your solutions, the quality of your problem resolving, the quality of your life, will be one, one, one. That's it. That's the quality, and that's how the laws of creation, that's how the laws will work for you, as I'll explain. That's how the whole system will work, because you, you're plugged into the functioning of laws at the tribal level. So you'll work, they'll work, but at the speed of the tribe. Dense and within time within, you'll, you'll, you're, you're someone who creates by committee, including the speed at which your health will heal. You heal at the speed of committee. So if, if, if you're somebody who will have to take medicine in a jar and it says, take this, you'll be sick for, sick for six weeks, and so you shall. Because you operate at the speed of committee. And if it says there's a likelihood, there's a 50, 60 percent chance that this will return, that's what you'll live at. And you'll be, there's a real good chance you'll be part of the return. Because you don't have enough energy. to get into the individualness required to outrun the speed of the tribe. Are you with me here? And the types of choices that need to be made. Now having said that, there's also the dynamics of the third column, which is sometimes it's time to go. None of us is getting off the planet alive. We are living in bodies designed to self-destruct. So we can only do the best we can or not. But in any case, we will all eventually pop out. So we have minimal control, but the control we have can be maximized by how well you understand the consequences of the choices that you're making. 
So we are in charge, we, we have an impact on the quality of our life, the quality of our body, the quality of our health, the quality of what? Even though that does not mean that we have the capacity to make everything perfect. Perfect is not the goal. Balance in all things, no matter what's happening, whether we're in a storm. If you're in a storm, you want to be a balanced driver. If you're in the most difficult times, you want to know how to say, I need to alter my relationship with time. I need to start thinking hour by hour now and not week by week. If I think in terms of week by week in this crisis, I will crush myself. I need to alter my watch and go into vertical time where my goal is hour by hour because I can survive this hour by hour. I am just fine hour by hour. And so I'll walk at that speed. Time to adjust time. But if I think in terms of year by year, I will crush, be crushed. So now it's time to adjust time. And I will get through this. That's how we do this. Now, back to woundology. Once I saw this, the way in which we th think, what goes on behind our eye, began to become a more and more rich tapestry. And it was at that point that I started to see the role that our personal choices met, had in our life. That how significant our inner choices were versus our outer choices. These were two different worlds of choice and two different power zones. They had two different levels of creation two different levels of impact, two different levels of authority. The choices we make in this world are, tend to be blended with the social mind. They tend to be influenced a lot more by what's happening in the world and therefore, they tend to be um, part. They tend to be of the world. So, what's going on in the world filters into our body through these chakras. You, none of us stand alone. What is in one is in the whole. So let me let me put it this way: We now live in the era of terrorism. Can we agree on that? There was a time when we didn't live in the era of terrorism. We now live in an era where, do we need a break? Yeah. Did I, did I go on overtime? No, you're good. You, you, no, you're 15, 20 minutes. Should we have a break now? Um, do we need a break? Yes. Yes. Coffee set up? Yeah, coffee set up. You saw him set up? Okay.